congregation rises as you are able. As we sing our gathering here for the morning number 744, Lord be glorified. 744.
Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to love one another, to follow in the way of his commandments, and to share his risen life with all the world. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We invite all children, young and old, to come forward for the children.
Jesus, thank you so much for taking what we are and what we have and building it into something amazing. When we hear those words in the Bible that we're like stones that you're using to build a house, or like blocks that you're using to build your tower, help us to know that means you love the gifts that we bring, and that you use us just as we are, and that you're using all kinds of other people and their gifts and abilities to build something amazing with all of us. Help us to trust that you're doing something amazing in us and through us. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up, everybody.
picture. And he and his friends live in my wallet, and these are the pieces of currency that I do need day by day, because when I need to run to the grocery store and buy, oh, we're out of bread, I need to buy some, so here's the money for it. Oh, I need to fill the car up with gas, oh, I need to get uh, something for the kids for school, or somebody needs new socks, or need to pay the light bill, or the gas bill, or the water bill, or whatever. Money that is in my wallet becomes the money that we use for things like that. This, in other words, is what I need to make sure I've got for my day-to-day -day living and our households running. This, I sort of think occasionally about, but I don't really count on it being there, and really doesn't do much with me so far in your life, too. I'm guessing there's money that you know exactly where it is and basically how much you've got. In a purse, in a wallet, in a checking account, something like that. That is your day-to-day, week-by-week spending money. You need to make sure there's enough in there for the things that you will face or have to pay for in the course of the week. That's what your living goes by, and the jar of change or jug of change is just sort of like wishful thinking. Maybe one day something good will happen. I call attention to this difference. Because I want us to be clear that when we reduce Jesus being just our heavenly jar of change, we empty him of all his power. When Jesus insists that he's the currency by which we live day by day, moment by moment, now, as well as for hope in life beyond the grip of death. And unfortunately, over the last 2,000 years, we have gotten really easy, comfortable, and really good at turning Jesus just into the future judge of change, that maybe one day will be something nice for you, but in the meantime, I can't really count on to do it there. Over enough centuries, over enough sort of sloppy creatures, it's easy to turn the Christian faith into believing, correct that a fact about Jesus, and then one day after you die, then it starts to kick in and be valuable, and maybe you'll have a very nice experience one day somewhere off in the future, but in the meantime, sorry, Jesus doesn't offer us. And it doesn't help that the words that we heard today from John's Gospel, so often in our common life, are read or mean in the context of funerals, and we often just hear them as, here's the time where Jesus promises one day we get to go in the many rooms in God's house, with many mansions, and that all that this is about is one day, when the judgment changes full, one day we'll get to be where Jesus is, and won't be nice then. But in the meantime, we're pretty much on our own. Sometimes we hear Jesus' words that Jesus doesn't mean them to be that way. But if you only hear certain words in the context of beyond death, it's easy to say, well, the Christian faith is basically a couple of points you put in every so often, believing the correct facts about Jesus, and then one day in the future there will be a payoff. Maybe we'll have a nice little treat. But in the meantime, basically, you're on your own. You've got to figure out your own way to get along in life. Jesus does not intend his words or his presence to be just a nice afterthought or one day off in the distant future that might or might not happen, depending on the intent, both for the promise of life beyond death and for the difference in life here and now. And we are missing something tremendous if all we do when we talk about our faith in Jesus is say, it's just basically a heavenly fire insurance policy so that I know one day when I die, I'm going to be afterlife. When Jesus intends to bring us more fully to life here and now. We're missing what Jesus is offering right now. God's jar of change. So there's a point in the conversation that we heard today from John 14 that Jesus makes it clear, right? So Jesus knows that uh, as he's saying these words to his disciples, things are about to get uncomfortable and scary and frightening for his disciples. What we heard from John 14 comes from the last line Jesus has with his disciples. This is what we just observed or celebrated about a month ago as Holy Week, as Monday, Thursday. This is the night Jesus' disciples have had their feet washed by Jesus. A chapter after that. Their toes are still dripping wet from Jesus washing their feet. They've just had what we call the Last Supper. Their mouths can still taste the bread and the cup that they have shared together. And in a matter of maybe hours, maybe less, they're headed to a garden where Jesus is about to be betrayed. They are 24 hours out from Jesus being nailed to a cross by the religious and political leaders of the day. And Jesus knows that's going to be scary for his followers to go through. And so he's preparing them. Okay, you're about to go through something it feels like your whole world is being turned upside down, and I'm here to tell you, when it happens, don't be afraid. I will be with you. It's going to seem like I'm going away, but in fact, I'm preparing a place for you, and I will come back and be with you. I will take you to be with me so that where I am, there you may be also. Okay. 
Okay, so whatever's going to happen, we don't need to be afraid. And then one of Jesus' disciples, God bless Philip, Philip says, okay, Jesus, um, how about you show us the Father? And Jesus goes, dude, that's in my translation, dude, have you not been paying attention? Seriously? Do you not get it? Like, have you not been with me all this time? You've seen the very presence of God. You've seen the very presence of the Father every time and ever you've been with me. If all Jesus had to offer was something after we die, this would have been the moment for Jesus to say, I know you want to see the Father, but not yet. you got to hold on. One day when you're very old man, and then one day you'll shuffle off this mortal soul, and then all of a sudden it'll all pay off one day in the distant future. He doesn't say that. He says, do. Dude, right here and now, I've been trying to show you the very presence and face of God. I've been trying to help you come more fully into life. And you bet that will extend beyond death. Even when death has done its worst, even when they nail me to a cross, it won't be the end. But even here and now, I want you to have fullness of life. That's what I've been showing you here and now. In fact, I'm inviting you, I'm expecting you to participate in doing the same kinds of things here and now that you've seen me do. In fact, doing even bigger things. I think that's sentence in this passage that frightens me the most. If I'm honest, that Jesus speaks to his followers and says, I envision big things for you. In fact, you're going to do greater things than you've seen me do here and now. Sometimes we get comfortable with church folk, thinking we're just a group, um, like a historical society who retells the greatest hits of stuff Jesus did, and then that's it. We just sort of tell stories about what God did a long time ago, and God's not doing anything anymore. But Jesus to his disciples, like, no, you are going to do amazing things that will show people the presence and the goodness and the love of God in real time and real places. And if you think about it, really, the work of God's people in the last 2,000 years in some moments really has been amazing. Like that, the first 12 disciples couldn't pull off a homeless ministry for their community or county, but were a part of one. The community of Jesus' original 12 disciples. Doubtful they could have raised a thousand bucks, making the soup and sandwiches and baskets go as far. My goodness, we're a small little outpost in this congregation, and we've done amazing things in this place that are part of something even bigger because we dare to believe what Jesus says. That here in our midst, God is doing something here and now through us, even now, and that our faith in Jesus is not simply the jar of change for one day down the road when it's full, when we have something nice, but even here and now, the presence of God we meet in Jesus. It's our currency, it's our bread and butter, it's our way of living day by day. Taking Jesus' word seriously means that even here and now, we get to experience, even if it just in glimpses, but real glimpses nonetheless, the very presence of God and the very fullness of life. We are promised that, yes, absolutely will last beyond the group of death as well, but it starts even here and now. If Jesus wanted to speak at him, just say, sorry, I don't have anything to offer for you now. You're going to have to wait till we die, Philip. He would have said that. Instead, he tells Philip, do right here, it's right now, here among you, every place you've seen and heard me, everywhere I've been among you, experience the presence of God here and now, that light happens it's our bread and butter now, it's not just a future wishful thinking windfall. The early church got that too, and one of the stories about how deeply the early followers of Jesus got that was our first lesson for today, which in some ways seems like a really, really sad story, but it's come to be really, really dear to me, and not just because the character in it shares my name. My namesake, Stephen, is one of those glimpses we get of early Christian church taking seriously, not just that their faith in Jesus meant that one day they'd go to heaven, but that right now it changed how they lived and faced other people, even faced hostility. So in case you don't know the story of Stephen, the backstory before what Yvonne read, Stephen was an early leader in the Jerusalem churches. The church was just starting to spread beyond just the first like 12 fishermen and tax collectors. They reached out and included people from different uh, ethnic backgrounds. And Stephen was one of these Greek-speaking Jewish people who came to faith in Jesus. He organized their first community food program. So early on, the Christian church was thinking, okay, let's reach out. Let's do bigger things than what Jesus did as a traveling itinerant ministry. We can now make sure that the people around us who have a need for food, the widows who don't have anybody to provide for, make sure they have food provided for. We organize that. And then, on top of doing that, he started telling his own people, fellow Jewish uh, people, about the, their own history and told them about how many times they turned away from God. Didn't like hearing their own history told to them. They didn't like how it made them uncomfortable. They didn't like the fact that every time uh, God had been gracious to them, they turned away to other gods. And Stephen keeps telling them, no, 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 I need you to understand. We need to tell our story, our own history, truthfully, rightly, even when it makes us squirm and did not care for that at all. So they covered their ears 
grab rocks to throw at him to put him to death. In that moment, Stephen takes seriously what it means to believe in Jesus. His response, instead of, well, if you're going to throw rocks at me, I'm going to grab some rocks, I'm going to throw them back at you, and I'll kill you first. Instead, Stephen gets it. To live the way of Jesus is to respond to hatred, not with hatred, but with love. To respond to violence, not with more violence, but with peaceability. And instead of lashing back at them, and I've got to get you before they get me, he prays for their forgiveness. He sees a vision of Jesus risen and alive, standing there by the throne of God. And his last words are, Lord, don't hold this sin against them before he prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Those words always sound kind of familiar. Those are the last words on Jesus' lips, too, right? As Jesus is dying on the cross, what does he pray? But in your hands I commend my spirit. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, the early church took seriously the way of Jesus to live it out in their own lives, that their lives would reflect the same love that doesn't answer hatred with hatred or evil for evil or violence for violence. They took that seriously enough in their own lives that they were willing to lay down their lives rather than, I've got to get you before you get me. They took it seriously enough. They were willing to lay down their lives for because they dared to believe the way of Jesus begins here and now as well as in the promise of life beyond that. What Jesus offers us is not just heavenly fire insurance or a jug full of change that maybe one day when it's full, maybe one day we'll get a new little treat out of what he offers us is the currency by which we live our lives even now. And in the midst of it all, even in a world that is scary and full of dangerous things, my goodness, see, we certainly knew that so did the early followers of Jesus too. Jesus' word is you don't have to be afraid. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I'll be with you through it. But that's a promise for how we live here and now as well. When we step out back into the world in the very near future, there are still going to be a million voices around us insistent on returning hatred for hatred and evil for evil and violence for violence. And that's just how the world works. That's what you've got to do, too. And the question for us will be, will be whether we dare to take the way of Jesus seriously enough to change the way we treat others here and now in this life and have deep enough confidence and, yep, Jesus got me beyond the grip of death that I can be a presence of love responding to hatred. I can be a presence of peace responding to violence right here and now as well. All of that depends on realizing our faith in Jesus is not just something I wait around for one day to take a test. It's the very currency by which we live our days right here and now as well. You might know this line from uh, the end of the classic romantic comedy when you're in this album. I don't get all my theology when I'm doing these romantic comedies, but a handful really, really helped me understand the good news of Jesus. And there's this scene toward the end of that classic movie with Bill Crystal, Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan, where he finally makes his big speech that he loves, the one they've been sort of on and off throughout the whole movie, and finally makes his big speech about like, why he sought her out and why this moment he needs to confess his love to her. And he blurts out, he says, I'm here because when you find the person you want to spend the rest of your life with, you want the rest of your life to begin as soon as possible. And I want to suggest nothing less than that is what's being offered to us as well. That Jesus doesn't say, I love you very much, but one day after you die, you finally get in relationship. He said, no, right here and now, I'm offering you the very presence of God. He's the one I want to spend the rest of my life with. That begins here and now. And yep, belongs and carries me through forever and ever beyond the grip of death. It's what we done here and now. In other words, we don't have to wait until we die to start living. We are invited to come fully to life, embodying the love of Jesus. We met in Jesus. We've seen embodied in him and in his followers over the last 20 centuries, even here thing about the jar of change is I don't have to think about it and basically it's just wishful thinking. And it's not going to do a whole lot when we even with all full. But the currency I live my day-to-day -day life with allows me to make sure my kids have food on the table and get the clean clothes that they need and care for others right around me here and now. Please, 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 sisters and brothers, don't settle for less. We trust in Jesus with the very presence of God, even here and now, as well as beyond the world. You don't have to wait to die to start the world.
down was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became true. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was there. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, who have acknowledged one baptism and forgiveness of sins, who look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the
Sending him the church's one foundation, number six five four. 